We've been having this uh, conference, I guess, now for four or five years, and today we have not had a deep dive on the payment systems that go behind the platform. So I'm thrilled today <laughs> to have a panel that's going to go in some detail with some very knowledgeable people about how platform systems work in conjunction with payment systems and how that back-end payments uh, works or sometimes doesn't work uh, in the uh, kind of facilitating the exchange. You know, platforms usually want to monetize. Maybe they have a free component, but there's usually, uh, to be sustainable, you got to get the money flowing uh, somehow. But the process of doing that is actually much more complicated than, uh, than you may imagine. So we're going to um, explore that space and uh, we're very fortunate here today to have uh, a number of people with very deep uh, expertise. So Frank Young, who's sitting next to me, um, is the uh, Senior Vice President at Global Payments. And he has um, tremendous experience in the space, both at Global Payments and then previously uh, with Google. Um, he also has experience at Qualcomm and a number of other uh, companies where um, he's, I guess, I don't know how many years altogether. You must have 20. Too many. Too many. Too many. That's a good question. Um, good point. Uh, in, the, in the payment space. And so uh, we're thrilled to have him. Also, we have uh, Jeremy uh, Neerum. He is um, the founder and CEO of Grocery Key. Um, and he is... Uh, blazing a trail in a new space, which is how do you create uh, white label uh, payment processing and a bunch of other um, value that can be brought to this grocery space, which has gotten a lot of attention given the acquisition of, uh, or the planned acquisition of Whole Foods by uh, Amazon. And then finally, um, we have Drew uh, Weinstein, who also is a serial entrepreneur and uh, also has um, deep expertise um, from a combination, he's been in consulting with McKinsey, but also spent some time with one of the big payment processors, uh, Visa, and so comes from a variety of angles. And he's working on a very interesting uh, project to uh, really harness the, the data layer that is associated with uh, the payment system. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, Frank just to say a few words about um, kind of your position and how you see this space, and then we'll go down the line, and then we'll do a deeper dive into um, kind of the, the nuts and bolts, kind of we'll do a 101 on mm -hmm. the payment industry. And I'll try to make it relevant to uh, platforms. So when I left uh, Google two years ago, um, helping them in, in their payment operations area and specifically with some of the consumer facing apps like Google Wallet and Android Pay, it was very obvious to me that if you wanted to make some impacts in commerce, digital commerce, you needed to get as close to the point of interaction between the consumer and the merchant as possible. Uh, a lot of people on the West Coast spend a lot of time facing off against the consumer, but it's the complexity of those merchant interactions, which I think is really represents the fascinating uh, space to focus on and to apply skills. Platforms kind of amplify that, that excitement and complexity by uh, tenfold, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about that. But Global Payments is, uh, views this platform space as strategically important. We're investing heavily in it. We process in over uh, 50 countries around the world. We move about a half a trillion dollars U.S. Uh, every year. A little closer to home here in U.S., we, we have the dominant market share within the restaurant category. The vast majority of fuel purchases, if uh, you're in the States and you've filled up your gas pump, we've probably helped move the money to do that. Uh, and globally, we have uh, offices in every, every continent. The sun never sets on, on global payments. Right. So yeah, I'm Jeremy Naren, uh, CEO of Grocer Key. As mentioned, um, we're providing white label e-commerce solutions. That's our primary product for, for grocery retailers, really helping them evolve in uh, the digital world. Um, and you know, just kind of piggybacking on the previous uh, discussion, we're also looking at how, how does grocery evolve, um, become more omni-channel. So uh, introducing uh, native mobile apps that eventually will power uh, mobile self-checkout. So, as it applies to, to payments, you know, we're a, par a partner of Global um, and really trying to, to offer retailers um, you know, solutions for looking at you know, card um, not present transactions, which are totally foreign to them up until now, and um, you know, how do you speed up checkout and, and save costs, which uh, grocery retailers love. Great. Andrew? Uh, hi, Drew Weinstein. I'm a co-founder and president of a new company called Velo Payments, started Chan One. Um, going pretty fast. So we are asking a very specific question, which is your 
Google, your General Electric, your Amazon, your SAP, your, the largest companies in the world, and your fundamental growth is fueled by globalization. Um, the pipes that were built to disperse funds around the world were built off of generally local or very few transactions. So, you know, the wire technology of the 60s is telex one-way messaging that was really made to move one payload of money to go buy magnets for GE to build MRIs or for Boeing to buy steel. And you get a bunch of people on uh, phones amongst the banks, the correspondent banks, and you track it. Well, one day you show up and pick your company. Some digital company is paying its app developers, its, its you know, sellers for Amazon, and so forth. Millions of payments a day across the whole world using dozens and dozens of banks who all have different formats of, and the like. And uh, the data problem is profound. The error rate is offensive for those who have ever seen it. And um, it's a problem of really old pipes. And as the AI discussion was talking about the difference between regulated and unregulated industries, uh, in a regulated industry like money, you can't just throw all the pipes out. So most folks who understand the pipes know the pipes are completely obsolete for today's large global corporations. Uh, unfortunately, we're stuck with them. So the question we asked was, what could we do uh, to change uh, the data set to improve the error rates, to have better visibility to um, funds flow, so that, as Frank mentioned, global payments is taking funds in from consumers on behalf of merchants, where the other half of the equation, the merchant has to pay its supply side, which at whatever that supply side is. Um, as I said, we're about six months old, started mostly by Visa folks. Our CEO is the former president of Visa. Um, I think I'm the youngest guy in the company, so we know a few things about payments, and uh, it's, been, it's been pretty interesting. We've got about $2 trillion in turnover that's being put on the platform uh, in the next couple of years, so uh, solving a pretty big pain point. Great. So why don't we jump into some of the basics of this industry for... I certainly is, wasn't an expert before I met you guys, so yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the process of learning, and I'm, sh I'm sure others in the audience as well could benefit. Yeah, so, so thanks. And so uh, Peter made the great suggestion trying to get a basic level of understanding. This is a fairly complex <laughs> model stripped down to the bare essentials. And so I thought it'd be useful to just give you a little bit overview of how payments works today. And this is a 60-year-old system that's been in place. Uh, there's a lot of money. Every time you all know how it works, you take a card out of, out of your wallet and you swipe it. Some of you may be old enough to remember those days with the knuckle buster where they unprint the card and send the sales draft to their bank. But this is the model. It's, it's referred to in the industry as the four-party model. Uh, and so the card holder, everybody in this room probably has a relationship with your issuer, your bank. Uh, when you go to the merchant for some goods or services, your merchant typically has a service provider that's referred to as an acquirer who gets that transaction and makes sure that it gets to the spot that has to authorize the availability of those funds. And then the issuer has a billing relationship uh, with the consumer where they're putting on your, on your credit card statement. Uh, and that's how it works. This process handles hundreds of billions of transactions a year around the world, every country. Uh, it's, it's driven a large part of our economy for a, a long period of time. Uh, interchange, uh, the dirty word everybody knows. In the U.S., these numbers are very, very U.S. specific, so apologies for some of you who are not U.S. based. These, the interchange numbers are quite different region by region. But in this model, the issuer, your bank, makes uh, transaction revenue, and the acquirer, it's a nickel and dime business, but it's a lot of nickels and dimes, uh, and uh, the merchant pays for it all. Uh, and so that's, that's the model today. Now, let me show you a picture of this in a platform economy and then try to draw out what complicates it. For the, for the most part, I think the very first comment of today was, we're living in exponential times, and yet the infrastructure really isn't keeping pace with how fast we're moving. And so in essence, we've, we've paved the cow path as it relates to payments. The payment between myself and Grocer Key, or myself and Amazon, or myself and Google, uses the same old model, right? It's the issuer, it's the merchant, it's the customer, the economics are generally the same. They've adapted some of the models. Uh, but now you've got this whole other dimension of complexity where you've got what we were referring to in this chart here as submerchants, subsellers. Now understand from a regulatory perspective, regulators expect the issuer to have full visibility into everything. Right? The issuer's responsibility is to know 
if I'm authorizing payment to somebody, I want to know where it's going to land. And I have to have visibility not only in, to the merchant, the platform, but if the platform is going to pay a developer, the bank may even want to know who the developer is and fulfill some compliance requirement there. And so the pain points, and this is why I think we, we encouraged uh, Peter to consider having this discussion today, is it really does represent some unique challenges for the platform economy, questions around data quality, process automation, straight through processing, uh, data normalization across the different industries, you know, the data structure that follows. Uh, and we've got a, a series of them here. And, and I know Drew and I have probably spent a good part of the past year trying to, trying to address these, but uh, Drew, why don't you talk about some of the real live examples of some of the, uh, some of the inefficiencies you're seeing in the industry? Well, let's just take, you know, a company that people know, take Amazon, you're gonna have core Amazon.com, you've got all these regional marketplaces around the world. Um, they are taking funds in all over the world. They're paying funds out all over the world. Thousands of bank accounts are required. So that means, in all likelihood, you know, hundreds of banks. Banks generally have built their own infrastructure or they partner with IBM or they partner with, you know, Booz or they partner with TSIS and they've got some of their proprietary, some different. You get many, many data formats. So, you know, this is a kind of just a simple map of like the world today as globalization has really allowed massive velocity for corporations to grow. And what's amazing is the back offices now are really in a pretty dire time. And the reason I say that is if you think it's bad now, go, you know, whoever, if you know anybody in your companies that have responsibilities to this, go ask them, you know, when they're talking to their banks, if the banks have capacity for hyperscale. So the real interesting discussion amongst, you know, treasurers at corporations or, um, you know, lead engineers or um, the, uh, the, the, the IT or the payment ops, et cetera, folks at banks is, what happens when the humans in back offices are replaced by bots, right? What happens when you take the Amazon use case and now, you know, the one, two, or three transactions that my wife makes on Prime is now 30 queries on Prime every single day because it's just the refrigerator realizing that the milk's out, okay? There is literally not a single bank ready in the world for hyperscale. And hyperscale is coming, being driven by all the companies and all the thought leaders in this room. So what we said was, what are the real problems and how are you solving them? Well, it's a, it's a platform solution, right? You've got to abstract beyond any one bank because, as I just mentioned, the corporations are going beyond any one service provider. So if you take a look at these, and I don't want to go into them in detail, but they should all make sense to you. Wires are really slow. Wires are really expensive. Um, you know, the amount of data you need in order to um, to, to Frank's point, in order to take a transaction from the consumer all the way to the submerchant uh, from a risk and compliance standpoint is a, is a lot of data. Uh, you know, your KYC information of your seller and then you need your AML information of what the funds were for. This is a, a tremendous amount of data that um, these large growing corporations are not um, uh, getting the services on the footprint that they have from the providers as they need it. So this is just a decent map. and You can spend all day on this, as you can imagine. So, so we'll, we'll probably keep these up, I think, for the yeah. remainder of it. Well, I don't know if you had any thoughts on, on this space, um, given that the U.S. grocery industry is, what, about a 400 or six, 60, $600 billion industry. By 2025, I think there will be like a billion transactions that, that uh, need to be consummated to get people fed on the system. So what do you see as uh, kind of the key issues for uh, if nothing is done and then what is, what is needed to uh, innovate in this space? Yeah, so, you know, yeah, the industry projections right now are indicating, you know, we could see up to $150 billion space, e you know, e-grocery space in the U.S. alone uh, by 2025. So. Right now, we're uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 2530. Um, so just you know, from a scalability perspective, there's some enormous issues there. Um, and then you know, speaking from an industry-specific perspective, there's, there's some issues that need to be resolved. Um, the complexities are uh, making sure consumers are charged the right amount um, and making sure that you're, you're getting paid. Uh, and the challenge there is we have major out-of-stock problems. So when a consumer places an order, they're not necessarily receiving exactly what they've ordered. And so the, the transaction amount changes. 
um, and then you have to figure out, you know, if there's uh, incremental purchases made, um, you know, products added to basket after you've ori originally authorized the transaction, uh, does that consumer have the available funds? So those are just kind of some of the more industry specific issues that pop up. And what's interesting, Frank and I were just dealing with a merchant together, major ride sharing company, who literally is in the process of, of thinking about vendors. And the main evaluation is the workflow on one narrow issue that, that, that Jeremy's touching on, which is the reversing of a ride for that ride sharing company, so the charge back. So programmatically um, facilitating that workflow which, again, given the velocity of these platform companies, is absolutely necessary. Uh, that was the sole decision criteria for that company, which is fascinating. Gotcha. I have a kind of big picture question. When, when you go to talk to platforms, they obviously, I guess, are beginning to experience this as a big pain point. Where does this sit in the organization <laughs> in terms of responsibility and people watching it? Because um, I don't see it flagged that much in the kind of the tech crunches of the world and, and, and kind of typical publications that are focusing on this area. So sort of where does this land and who bears the cost um, and who's flagging the risk um, that you're pointing out? Yeah, I, I know, Drew, you've got a, a view on this. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take a view of it just from, uh, you know, from my days at Google, I always found the payment operations engineers pr pretty fascinating folks because, you know, Google tends to hire, you know, the, the greatest engineering talent in the world. And so when you go to Google, you have dreams oftentimes of working on self-driving cars and robots, and, <laughs> and now I'm sticking you with having to rewrite our billing system. Uh, it becomes a, uh, a tough uh, assignment. Uh, so what they tend to focus on and what they look for in a partner is somebody with a very high quality API set, very easy to integrate with. They speak the language of the engineers, or they don't want to waste any time understanding the, the nuances, and they want to move incredibly fast. Uh, and I, I find with every platform company I've ever spoken to, if I don't have an engineer at the table talking to their engineers, it's typically a wasted conversation. Because the engineers are the ones, here's how we're gonna wire this to deliver the experience, and they're no longer satisfied paving the cow path because they're trying to create entirely new experiences. And so the, the, the body politic in the platform organizations are typically the engineers who are looking to hyperscale their business. Yep. It's not until they mature that they even hire somebody who you'd consider head of payment ops, who starts bringing in a little bit of gray hair and some, some insight okay. as to how you manage compliance and risk. Um, it's a really, really fascinating, uh, fascinating space, and Drew, you probably have a perspective well, as well. Well, I think uh, you guys could imagine, that's why we're here talking about platforms. This is a fascinating topic because it's, it's in the midst of massive change. Um, if you take a large corporation, even a technology-driven organization, you know, for us to sell in our software, we're gonna have stakeholders in uh, pr product group, so usually payments product. We're gonna have operations, payment operations, reconciliation, customer success. We're definitely gonna have treasury involved because this is about you know, visibility to progress of money movement. So folks who, whoever wants to know where their cash position is, right? We can have in-state uh, visibility to where the money is around the world. And then you ultimately start boiling up to finance. And what's fascinating is in platform companies, you can find a head of payments, which is a beautiful thing because that person actually should notionally have this mandate. Um, but unfortunately, uh, for very, very large corporations, the notion of a head of payments is uh, why would we need that? Well, instead, you have you know, 15 stakeholders that all have to come together to, to make a, a very complex decision. Uh, so I think the real answer, which is a, it's a fascinating answer, uh, because it's a fascinating problem, is like this is going to change a lot. Um, and I think those companies who are driving scale and driving globalization feel the pain more than others. If you're hyper-local, uh, you can kind of, you know, kind of scrunch down the org a little more because you're dealing with fewer variables. But once you start jumping borders and more regulators and more currencies and uh, uh, interfaces from service providers, it becomes you know, very decentralized. Gotcha. So um, you know, one of the tenets of platforms is network effects and things of that. Are we just talking in this instance of um, just an efficiency play and a removal of kind of, uh, you mentioned uh, the error rates and things of that nature, or does it become integral to your platform strategy and somehow the payment system is not just facilitating 
the exchange that needs to happen because it needs to happen, but becomes a strategic play in this growth. And you know, as Marshall pointed out, size seems to matter in the platform space. And so how do you think about the payments or do you, when you pitch your, your solutions, yeah. do, do you have a strategic conversation or is this just a uh, kind of a, hey, we can process engineer your payment system and relieve some pain points kind of conversation? Um. I'll take it, but I mean, we all have probably a different take on the pitch. Um, so, so the the pitch it's a kind of a fun pitch. If if I have a, a party that's very you know kind of data driven, uh, we can walk in and just talk about error rates. And we can talk about how many currencies you're trying to manipulate, how many banks do you have to uh, oversee. The more interesting discussion, the strategic discussion. So we have a client that has almost ten billion dollars a day of unsettled funds flow. The truth is, that's not the amount of money in the wild. They get their data so late from banks, no more often than once a day. If they had in-state visibility to, to their data, they would actually really only have about $3 billion unsettled. So that, that $7 billion uh, that they're counting as unsettled affects all of their liquidity. It affects all their covenants with their banks when they're building new office buildings or whatever, and, and their, their CFO is in negotiations with their bank partners. All of that affects it. So there's one aspect where it's strategic. The more interesting part for platform companies, and playing off the tail of the edX discussion about unbundling, the fun part of the discussion is increased liquidity. So your supply side, let's say your Uber, Uber, if you ever try to register, and it's just, by the way, it's a really fun uh, experience just to think about what they care about is, you have to have a bank account. Well, lots of people come from all over the world with a driver's license and they show up here without a bank account. Well, why couldn't we pay those people to PayPal? Why couldn't we pay them to Alipay? Well, banks can't do it for a whole bunch of regulatory reasons. So one of the things that we talk about with clients is unlocking liquidity by bringing more work, folks who can work into the franchise and there's a really cool study, I recommend everybody read it, McKinsey did it two Junes ago, called The Future of Work, and they yeah. estimate that 550 million people will join the franchise who are either unbanked or don't have direct access in their local community to a job, and they'll either get the job from a digital interface and they'll be able to pay from something other than a bank account. Fascinating. You know, there's a really, uh, there's a really interesting observation in, in, in platform history that I often use, you think about the original kind of e-platforms, the, the Amazons, the Ebays back in the 90s and early 2000s. You know, my observation is, again, this, this fact that uh, things were hyperbolic and moving so fast, they were so unhappy with the existing banking infrastructure, Amazon created a, an entity that's called Amazon Payments today, which in its own right is a massive payment operation eBay purchased PayPal and managed PayPal, and a lot of that was a function of the fact that they needed to define, own, and control the user experience to a degree that the traditional banks and financial providers were unable to do it, so they had to own and control it. Fast forward, Alibaba, Alipay. Alipay, 10 years from now, is gonna have every financial institution on the planet shaking mm -hmm. in its boots. Uh, because again, they're trying to deliver an experience at a scale and at, at, at a pace that the existing infrastructure is just incapable. I also, you know, Starbucks, if you consider them being a, a platform in the, in the real world, Starbucks Mobile, I want to say, has balances on their stored value account of $12 billion that would make them a top 20 financial institution in the United States. <laughs> um, if everything goes well with Jeremy, there's going to be grocer pay in 10 years, and, you know, he, he, he could potentially be the platform that manages the funds for, for grocery and settlement. So in the world of platform uh, uh, kind of academics and, and study, that's a really fascinating dynamic to sink your teeth into is how platforms kind of consume these support functions inside their you know, four walls, if that's a legitimate term, to own and control the experience. It really does uh, serve to disrupt traditional industries to a great degree. Gotcha. Yeah. So you know, I think of banking and payments and things, I think of well-established industry, hard to break into. So, so Jeremy, what got you into this space and sort of what are your entrepreneurial roots and mm -hmm. um, how, did you, how did you do this in this daunting <laughs> kind of well-established industry? Yeah, so I've been uh, you know, kind of an e-grocery guy for 12 years now. I created a, um, an on-demand grocery delivery service in Madison, Wisconsin in 2006. Uh, ran that business for about 10 years and that's what really evolved into 
um, to, to GrocerKey. We saw an opportunity to leverage our, our technology and our operational know-how to assist brick and mortar retailers. And obviously we're kind of uh, arriving at a tipping point with Amazon having purchased Whole Foods. Now it's kind of like the holy crap moment. We need to, we need to do something about our e-commerce efforts. And quite honestly, I think it's, it's great news for the industry because um, these are things that grocery retailers probably should have been doing uh, well before now. Um, but if, if this is the catalyst that it takes to, to get them moving in that direction, so be it. Um, I think it's a, it's a good thing for the space. And, you know. and so let's stay on the grocery topic for a minute, because to tell you the truth, this has not been a topic uh, that we've explored. Um, we didn't think that platformers would move into this space. So can you help us understand uh, a little bit about what's happening uh, mm -hmm. in the grocery space? I guess it's pretty fragmented. Um, yeah. So what's happening today, and then where do you see it uh, evolving in the next five years or so? Yeah. So just to put it in perspective, you have uh, about 38,000 grocery stores, physical grocery stores in the US. Roughly 25,000 aren't doing anything today um, with e-commerce. So there's um, an enormous amount of, of need, really, to evolve into this space. Um, and you know, most grocery retailers are focused on what goes on within their four walls. Um, but you have uh, excess retail space right now that can, that can be accessed for, for e-commerce. So the starting point for most, most grocery retailers is how can we leverage our retail space to get into e-commerce and start uh, fulfilling orders. But they don't have you know, software expertise and they don't have the operational know-how for, for e-commerce. So you know, that's what we're really bringing, bringing to the table. Um, is you know, a comprehensive e-commerce solution and, and the ops expertise for how do you effectively turn your brick and mortar store into a, uh, a warehouse for e-commerce fulfillment and that will evolve down the fulfillment spectrum into um, you know, dark stores, ware rooms, and uh, eventually fully automated warehouses which you know, many of the uh, kind of more progressive retailers um, uh, overseas are already doing. We're actually lagging way behind uh, when it comes to, to e-grocery in the U.S. And Frank, if um, do you have a perspective on the grocery space, and then uh, what is pay Global Payments' linkage to a company like Grocery Key? Are you just following what they're doing, or do you have uh, business interests that well, link now, together? You know, you could. Uh, we love uh, we love food, shelter, and clothing. Right, everybody needs them, and so lots of transactions. Yeah, lots of transactions, and so you know, in the grocery space, we have a fairly uh, we have a fairly significant uh, base. We, we tend, at least in the United States and many of our markets around the, around the world, we tend not to shoot for the high-end enterprise. It's such a razor-thin margin business. We, we uh, serve through high-touch service, uh, the middle market, and even the regional. We have a lot of bodegas in our, in our portfolio. Uh, but uh, to Jeremy's point, this is ripe for innovation, ripe for digitization. Uh, and coming into this job just two years ago into one of the leading financial technology companies in the world, uh, I, I come with a passion for platforms and I see that we as a service provider need to be serving these kinds of verticals in a much more uh, platform friendly way. So uh, every one of these pain points are pain points we've designed uh, technology uh, either ourselves or in partnership with some of the folks that are in this room. Uh, to solve these problems for specifically for platforms. And so if you think about you know, what a platform owner needs to be able to understand who are their customers paying them and who are their sellers selling to, the ability to have visibility into that, reporting uh, structured commission rates that might vary across the, the different varieties, that platform is a very interesting space for us to be uh, operating in and, um, and where uh, we couldn't be more grateful than than we are for Jeremy's uh, business with Grocery Key because we do think that the upside is is as un unlimited as you can get. So. Gotcha. So um, most people don't think of payments and data being connected. So Drew, can you help us walk through your thinking about the relationship between payments and data and where mm -hmm. where's the value there? Well, and you know, I, mean, th I think uh, if you go to the next slide, you might use that as the yeah. backdrop. Oh, sure. For, um, mm -hmm. So like, I mean, you know, money money is a fiction, right? I mean. You know, we all want to say it's real, but it's not, right? It's like time. Uh, what is it? Um, money is really zeros and ones. And when you go to talk to a large bank, it's truly zeros and ones. It's ledgers and ledgers and databases. Uh, there's, one da there's one bank we're working with that has 44,000 separate databases. Really? Accounts, audits, 
compliance, risk, money, all over the place. It's just data. So when you think about how you're going to change the world from uh, some of the pain points that we discussed of paying millions of folks, and, and this is there's a there's a local version of this, and and if you think about you know grocer key, you know grocer key is an evolution of what you know Square, which does only in the physical world, right, with a food truck, and what Stripe does only in the e-commerce world, and what Jeremy's doing is saying you can do it in all, right, as one company, which is really really cool. Um, what th what that requires is data. So from our perspective, the movement of money. Uh, when you get to the big enterprise, which is where we play, um, is really all about data. Because you've got your, take any of these companies and mentioned, Amazon was just mentioned, you've got service providers all around the world, banks all over the world. Well, they all act differently, right? They've got different regulators and they've got different incentives and your relationship with them. You know, one, one shop is gonna charge you uh, for transaction fees and FX and the next one won't even tell you your cost basis, they'll give you earnings credits and hope you take loans from them. You won't even know your costs, which is a disaster. And somehow you've gotta go up and report to your CFO and normalize all this. So our thesis generally is that abstraction is critical, um, that, there, that you're not in the next two decades going to ask the largest companies in the world to move off of their critical relationships with banks. Um, one of our governing theses is you know, uh, corporations don't use banks by choice. They use banks because they don't really want to insource compliance. And if you want to understand one thing that a bank is, regardless of the future, however you see it, a bank is a public trust and it's a node of trust. So once you open a bank account with that bank, that bank has a responsibility to your corporation or to you personally uh, for whatever uh, you're doing with them. And they have that responsibility, the regulators, right? So from that, you say, okay, well, if they're going to be the public trust, well, how do you un, you know, unlock all the friction that is that you know, multiple interface problem, the, the, the large error rate problem? It has to be abstraction. So what, what we talk about, and we use this image just to help people um, kind of you know, uh, visualize how we see the world is you know, layers of cloud-based microservices can be installed in lots of places uh, throughout the value chain from interoperating with corporate ERP all the way towards giving your vendor, your payee, your Amazon seller um, some um, logic that they don't have today. Right now, I don't know if you guys know, wires are one-way messages which have no feedback loop. So there is, like you send a local payment, like an ACH, it actually will bounce back if it doesn't get there. A wire will just go into a black hole. So and all the large corporations in this room are massively dependent upon wires to move money around the world. Well, sending one-way messages in a world where you know, we have very rich data relationships with lots of our counterparties is, is idiotic. So what we're basically asking is how do we marry the public internet to this very trusted infrastructure that we're all kind of dependent on, which is the banks. So Jeremy, what's your? Do you have a data strategy, or are you just selling? Software? Uh, well, I'm not sure I want to follow that. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, the biggest the biggest thing we encounter, frankly, I mean, it's much more much more straightforward. But um, you know, grocers are concerned uh, about cost. You know, first and foremost, it's a very low margin business. Um, you know, talking about a couple percent net. And so when you have an industry being turned on its head where transactions you know, are being more, more and more going to be flowing uh, through the e-commerce channel and you know, through your phone, uh, it's, it's presumably going to be a little bit more expensive. And um, the question becomes, how much can you reduce the cost to, to the retailer to, to, to make it a little more palatable? Cool. So I do I change up a little bit? Um, I know that uh, you're opening an innovation center uh, in we are. Barcelona. Yeah. So can you tell us? Kind of, what are you thinking about in terms of innovation, and are you doing it alone, or are you partnering with others? So uh, the the tack we're taking, we don't want to open up an innovation physical structure that's just us kind of tinkering, uh, and so we've partnered with uh, four other companies. Okay. Uh, we've chosen Barcelona. Anybody here from from Barcelona? It's uh, become my favorite European city, <laughs> but it's a um, visit it. It's <laughs> absolutely beautiful. But uh, we're partnering with Visa, Samsung. Uh, Arval, a company in, uh, in Europe, and Caixa Bank, who's been a very long-term partner of ours. Uh, and we're going to use Barcelona, and there could be other cities uh, over time, as a place where we can uh, bring platform companies from around the world to brainstorm and ideate on many of the issues and challenges that we've been 
we've been talking about. I think that news just came out yesterday. So, so thanks I, for asking about it because it's near and dear to, uh, yeah, to me. I knew so. you were working on it. I didn't realize you announced it yesterday. Yeah. It's good timing yeah. but on that one. How about you guys? What do you see as sort of a kind of a next iteration of innovation? What are you doing to, to innovate um, in this space? Yeah, so for us, one of our big efforts is um, how do you aggregate e-commerce transactions or e-commerce purchase history and in-store purchase history, and then what are the exciting things you can do around that? So, you know, a lot of people are working with, uh, with beacons. We're doing some stuff with ultra-wideband technology. So um, you can imagine a world where you know everything that consumer has purchased both online and in-store and exactly where they are in, in the store in real time. Uh, what you can do uh, from a personalization standpoint in that environment. So that's that's primarily what we're really excited so about. So the idea there is to target ads and and offers Correct. And, and things yeah. of so, that nature. You know, so relevant, um, personalized offers uh, while they're, they're, they're in aisle or they're, they're purchasing online. Gotcha. And then um, do you retain the data or do you have to share it with the grocer that you're working with? How does that work? Yeah, so we can we can leverage the data across all retailers we're working with. Obviously, we're not sharing uh, customer data, but we can um, you know we can aggregate purchase history uh, across all the retailers we work with and uh, come up with uh, proprietary algorithms based on that. Gotcha. So um, I think I would be remiss not to ask about blockchain. So I don't know if you have some views on blockchain, but I'd be interested in uh, your thoughts on what this means for this industry. Is it relevant, irrelevant? Uh, are you doing anything in this space? Uh, somebody said it earlier, as it relates to payments money movement, um, it's not even on my radar as something that's gonna be material impact, materially impactful. I think it's got other smart contracts, um, identity verification, real promise, but money movement, not an issue. Gotcha. Well, we use blockchain, so. Um, so so the only way you can pull off uh, uh, what we're talking about here is by thinking about you know presentation layers and thinking about um, uh, permissioning and and channels of communication and then what you want to store. So we're using blockchain protocol. We're using smart contracts to create immutable audit trails on behalf of our corporate clients. Um, it's actually pretty fascinating to see as data proliferation goes the way it's going, uh, how folks are thinking about audit. Um, and it's at the banks, it's, a, it's generally speaking a real problem um, because uh, the foot, the, right now there's a kind of an, a legacy default where banks actually use audit databases. And a lot of our IP is on the hypothesis that you know, we need to bring auditors and regulators into the discussion, as was said earlier in AI. So what we've done, and our, most of our IP is around permissioning. So our public cloud actually has different permissioning for our payors, our payees, the service providers who are going to be providing us confirmatory data that money's moving, and then their regulators, right? So the bank's regulators need access to events to know things happened. But they need a really small amount of data. The banks need a little bit more data, but a lot less data than the payors and the payees need. So where we've really invested is on this notion of hierarchy of access to information. And you know, uh, we could geek out and talk about elliptical curve encryption when what, what gets where and who's using 2FA at what moment and all that. But um, talking about our roadmap, I did want to just answer because it's, I think it's important that you guys understand all of these money problems are ultimately solved by network effects. If you look at the grocer key business, it feeds itself. You know, independent markets are going to get the benefit of Jeremy's roadmap when inventory management is done better mm -hmm. um, and the SLA increases. That's all the benefit of more users on the platform accelerating his roadmap. We're the same way. Um, we are putting software in behind firewalls of the largest banks in the world. Um, the payee data that we get to improve the error rate being able to have the payee getting paid by Google, who then needs to be paid by Apple, having that person's improved data tokenized, highly secure in our cloud, allows the next payor to have a repository of where that person uh, correct payment information actually resides. So there's a tremendous network effect uh, in next generation payments. Gotcha. So why don't we uh, open it up for some questions, and uh, please. You know, one of the, and, and maybe to stir some conversation, if you go to the last page, what uh, Peter suggested was uh, 
some commonly referred to names. We'd be remiss if we didn't uh, kind of put, put a framework like this up there <laughs> to spur some, some conversations. These are the payment models to watch. Global payments, grocery key, velo, you might not be aware of them, but uh, any questions around any of these players, I think we can all share an opinion on. Please. Um, hi, uh, David Rancher from Google. Um, one thing I've always been, I've always wondered is, um, when will a player, or, or what's blocking a player from, from truly closing the loop the entire way, right? Amazon, you know, I, I could predict that I'm going to spend 100 bucks on Amazon every single month. So maybe Amazon cuts a deal with my employer and, you know, says instead of putting it into your bank, put in the Amazon bank, uh, you know, spend your money here. We'll give you 1% back because you did that. Then Amazon pays their suppliers and the suppliers keep some of their money in the bank and it just keeps going around in a loop. Is it Regula I, I can't, I've been the first person I think of this. Is it regulatory? <laughs> is it the fact that Amazon doesn't want to take on, I, I think, I can't remember who said, you know, doesn't want to take on the compliance themselves? Is it something else? What, what, what's going on? What's blocking that? You know, I, th I think part of it is somebody like Amazon is probably closest to being able to close the loop because the entire transaction happens on their platform. The traditional, you know, in the, in the Google, you know, I spent a good part of my time working with the team at Google. When I was there trying to figure out that, 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 uh, that question of, I go online and I search, can I see it all the way through to the point that the purchase transaction happens and then feed that back into the ROI measurement. My, my view at the time is that everybody involved in that transaction, I only showed you a few of the parties. Somebody did it in an analysis. A single card transaction touches 15 different people. And every one of them seems to believe that they own the data. Uh, and if one of them emerges as a potential owner, like the merchant says, I'm going to use this in all these crazy ways, the bank says, hold on, guys, regulation says you can't. Or if the bank tries to use it, the merchant says, there's no way that's, you know, Mr. Issuer, that's not your data. Then the acquirer, the network, Visa, MasterCard, every player on this page thinks they own it. And so back to Marshall's comment, I think closing the loop, uh, governance, uh, just big circle. You, when will we get to a point of, Efficient data flow is when we've got an appropriate governance model governing privacy and, and the data of these commerce transactions. Well, I, I had a responsibility to ask this question quite a bit. I spent some time at Visa. So the first thing, a bunch of quick anecdotes. Uh, why did Visa work so well? Uh, for those who don't know, Visa started in Fresno, California. They terminalized everything before they started. Perfect ubiquity. Every merchant in Fresno, California accepted a visa with a knuckle buster. Every consumer had a card under their door, even if they weren't credit worthy. The test was not credit risk. The test was network effect. And it worked perfectly. Perfect acceptance, perfect issuance. The problem when you go to a closed loop, and I'm about to give you the punchline, is you can never have perfect acceptance. And every merchant wants one thing, accept all money. So here's the proof. Walmart, who is the most insane merchant on earth when it comes to interchange, they're the only people who have ever successfully sued Visa MasterCard. They still accept Amex. That's all you need to know. Why will we never go to merchants and closed loops? Because Walmart still accepts Amex. And they still accept Amex because they don't want to turn somebody away at the door. Less than one, call it 0.75% of electronic transactions at, Amex, at, at Walmart or Amex, they don't want to turn that tiny sliver of business down even if it costs them an incremental 250 bips. Great. So there well, you go. With that, I think we're out of time. But thank you very much, Frank, for